It's the late days of World War I. Disillusionment reigns supreme. And there's a short story written that makes you think, So? It must be Ernest Hemingway. Welcome to Strip Coverlet, where we squeeze the bigger picture out of literature. I am Adrian Fort, and we are here for the latest in a short story by short story read-along of the Finca Vigia edition by Ernest Hemingway. I believe this is the 23rd part of this series. I believe that, uh, but I am not quite sure right now. I did not check before hitting the record button, and I care so little about this short story that I had to force myself to hit the record button. That's half facetious, but I think that this is a short story which is indicative of one of the problems that many people do have with Ernest Hemingway's complete canon. Maybe not individual short stories, but when you're talking about the whole thing, this short story is sort of indicative of that. But I think that there is. So, okay. It's not just me that says, so what? This is a short story that is widely known among scholars, among Hemingway fans, among readers in general of that ilk. Uh, people just, there is a large question even in academe as to what this short story is about. And if you know anything about the the academe, they are willing to tell you anything that they think they can make a short story about. So I think that there is actually something here, uh, but I think that you do have to do a little bit of work to do it. We will have a So What Happened recap of the short story, a literary criticism section, and then a writer's corner that has but one note. So what happened? It's fall in Milan and the war is still going, but no one is paying much attention. Our narrator is in the hospital, injured knee. There's a major with an injured hand next to him. There is a group of three other young men who come to visit our narrator. One of them has facial wounds, and they all walk to Cafe Cova together. Facial wounds as in he's missing his nose. Our narrator is self-conscious because he is an American, and he does not feel that his medals and his injuries are comparable to the others. He has a more difficult relationship with the major in the next bed who yells at him about his Italian grammar. Then, during conversation, the major says that the man must not marry. You must not get married. You shouldn't find yourself a wife. Then, one day in the middle of this type of thing, he storms off to use the phone. He comes back and apologizes to our narrator Maybe Nick Adams. Like, this is conjectured to be a Nick Adams story. It is not delineated as a Nick Adams story. I think it's easy to accept it as a Nick Adams story. He comes back and apologizes to our narrator, saying that his wife just died. The major excuses himself again, and the doctor comes in in the wake of all of this and says that the major had just married the girl. Um, and had just married the girl when he knew that he was done with active duty in the war. She was young and died of pneumonia. After then, he leaves for th after that he leaves for three days, and then he returns. Uh, but he is despondent when he returns. The major leaves for three days, comes back, and is despondent. Is the three day weekend? Uh, a Jesus metaphor? No, I don't think so. So, um, what are we talking about here? Here's what I think the actual the actual um, meaning to this short story is. What I think it's actually about, and it is something that is deep. This is not so. Hemingway writes a lot of short stories that's very easy to read them and think. So what? What are we talking about here? Uh, three guys went to get coffee and or chocolate and cigarettes, a little bit of coffee once in a while. No, I think that what that part of the short story is doing, what you're getting when you are setting up the sort of um, correspondence between these young men who are injured is just that. 
You were showing correspondence. You were showing friendship. You were showing a growing type of ambiance in the the almost post-war period. What you're also getting there is the fact that these young men have gone to war and all been injured. So one of them has his nose blown off. The, our, our narrator tells us that his nose... Now, the reason I keep going back to this is because World War I, it's like it's possible, I think, that some of the gases that were used could have caused problems with your uh, soft tissues and you would lose your nose. Probably, though, these are explosives, right? That's a lot of the, the artilleries and stuff in World War I are explosives. To lose your nose but survive is a maddening type of what we would have to refer to as luck. To be in the theater of war and have your nose blown off but survive is a wild proposition. So there's that. Then we have our narrator who is from America. So he traveled all the way across the ocean to go to war and ended up injured, but still survived. Okay, great. But in the theater of war, what good does it do you to make plans for your future? It doesn't. You don't know if you're going to be alive tomorrow. You don't know if, say, you found someone that you thought you loved and you get a disfiguring injury like the man who lost his nose. Does that person stick around? Right? These are things that you have to, you have to worry about. Do you find someone and have kids knowing that you might not be there to raise them? These are, these are legitimate questions for people going to war. You, you have to ask yourself these things. There's no nice way around it, but they are the reality. So you do not plan for the future, maybe, if you are headed off to war. Or you plan for the future because you have to have something in your life to look forward to, right? Otherwise, why go through it? If I don't have someone waiting for me on the other side of this thing, why go through it? So the future, the idea of planning itself becomes very tenuous when you are not in control of your today. The major did know he wasn't going back to active duty. The major did know he was done with that part of the thing, but he still had to be enlisted. He still had to be there. He still had things he had to do in the war operation. So he went and made plans. He went and found himself a wife. And then she dies of pneumonia. Now, basically, what that does is it says that, hey, you can't, you can't guess it, buddy. You can't plan it. You are not in control. And here's the reason that I think that is the meaning behind the short story. That basically, whether you are or whether you aren't doing something, you're not in control anyway. So just, just you, you got you to gotta do it, man. <clears throat> that was kind of the zeitgeist for the expatriates the expatriate writers was sort of in, which, which is ironic because among those writers there was a very large disavowalment of religion Reli one of the religious tenets is god is in control right so you would think that the anti-religious literary movement would be to say ultimately i am in control but it's not the movement which arose around these things is to say Hey, man, nobody's in control. Isn't that terrifying? Isn't that terrifying? No one is in control. 
There's no, we are but leaves of grass thrown to an uncaring wind. Um, <laughs> yeah, so I think that that's actually the meaning behind this short story. Um, I don't know how prevalent that argument is among, among scholars. All of the conversation that I've ever been privy to for this short story, whether it be through print or whether it be through uh, dialogue, is that uh, I, I don't get anything out of the short story. But I think that that message is there. <clears throat> You're not in control, man. You're not in control. And that was a, a message among the expatriate type writers. Now, the second idea here that I have that I think is worth talking about with the literary criticism in this short story is something that rises sometimes in Ernest Hemingway. There is almost a thread of desperation that often pops up with Ernest Hemingway's protagonists, but I think it's a little bit more nuanced than that. I don't think it's quite desperation. I think it's something closer to being isolated around people. The mass of men lead a life of quiet desperation. I think that the quiet desperation really is realizing that you're alone. And I think that a lot of what we have in this short story is people realizing that they're alone no matter how close they are to other people. I think that that is part of what our narrator is going through and, and why he has this anxiety about whether or not his injuries are real enough and whether or not his medals actually mean anything. I think that that is largely what we have with the major who is having an absolute breakdown. He's having an absolute breakdown advising another man you have to be alone. Don't, don't marry. Don't marry. It's awful. And it's not awful because he's mistreated in his marriage. It's awful because he feels that he is a victim of the universe. Right? He feels that he is now, though he is stationed so close to someone else, he feels alone. He thought that he had found his person. He thought that he had found his woman. He thought that he had found a wife. He thought he had found the one. Dead. Gone. Pneumonia. You know, sucks. Um, I think that that's where the major's frustrations come from. It, he's, he's not, if you pay attention, he's not just sad, quiet. In this short story, he's trying to interact with ostensibly Nick, right? He, he, he engages with him. He talks to him. But little things piss him off. You're Italian. Your grammar's awful. Why don't you fix that? You got time to sit around? You don't have time to work on your grammar? Come on. 30 minutes a day. Do something, pal. Right? He, these weird little things are bugging him until he works his way up to have an actual meltdown. I think that is the slow boiling realization. You can be around as many people as you want. Doesn't mean you aren't alone. The last thing I want to talk about here, the writer's corner portion of this video is this. Would you have the courage to write this short story. Sounds like a melodramatic question. Sounds like a stupid question. Sounds silly to say. But I mean it. I don't know the year this was published. I imagine the 20s. So you're talking about a short story that has been around for a hundred years. It was around from Hemingway, right? Millions of people read this short story every year. Every year, millions of people read this short story and think so. A lot of the scholarly activity around this, this short story is trying to figure out so what. Would you have it in you to write this short story? I don't know that I would. I... And the way that our narrator is self-conscious about whether or not his wounds 
um, are worthy of his medals, I am very self-conscious about whether or not my words are worthy of the minds reading them. I don't know that I would have the courage to write a short story with this little to look at. These few things to think about with so little actual action and think, oh yeah, baby, someone's going to want to read that. A hundred years from now, they'll be reading this one, baby. I don't know that I have the courage to do that. I don't know that I have, I, th I think that I, um, I am too paranoid. Do you have it in you to write a short story that you know, you think there's something in there, but you don't know if anyone's ever going to find it and go ahead and, and put that short story out there anyway. I don't know. I don't know if I do. That is all I have for this uh, short story discussion. If you like or appreciate what it is that I do here, hitting the like button really does help me out as it tells YouTube to share this video with other literature lovers. And if you find yourself here by chance, but not design, literature is the only thing I talk about on this channel, dropping multiple videos every single week. There's poetry every Monday, and I hope to have you back for the next one.